religious chauvinism to rabid nationalist fervor are beginning not to work. This is who I am and whether I'm good or bad or achieving or not, all that's learned along the way. Just a ride. We can change it anytime we want. It's only a choice. No effort, no work, no job, no savings of money. I realized that I had the game wrong. That the game was to find out what I already was. We were saying how very important it is to bring about in the human mind the radical revolution. The crisis is a crisis in consciousness, a crisis that cannot anymore accept the old norms, the old patterns, the ancient traditions. And considering what the world is now, with all the misery, conflict, destructive brutality, aggression, and so on, man, he's still as he was, he's still brutal, violent, aggressive, acquisitive, competitive, and he has built a society along these lines. Society today is composed of a series of institutions. From political institutions, legal institutions, religious institutions, to institutions of social class, familial values, and occupational specialization, it is obvious the profound influence these traditionalized structures have in shaping our understandings and perspectives. Yet, of all the social institutions we are born into, directed by, and conditioned upon, there seems to be no system as taken for granted and misunderstood as the monetary system. Taking on nearly religious proportions, the established monetary institution exists as one of the most unquestioned forms of faith there is. How money is created, the policies by which it is governed, and how it truly affects society are unregistered interests of the great majority of the population.
In a world where 1% of the population owns 40% of the planet's wealth. In a world where 34,000 children die every single day from poverty and preventable diseases. And where 50% of the world's population lives on less than $2 a day. One thing is clear. Something is very wrong. And whether we are aware of it or not, the lifeblood of all of our established institutions, and thus society itself, is money. Therefore, understanding this institution of monetary policy is critical to understanding why our lives are the way they are. Unfortunately, economics is often viewed with confusion and boredom. Endless streams of financial jargon coupled with intimidating mathematics quickly deters people from attempts at understanding it. However, the fact is, the complexity associated with the financial system is a mere mask designed to conceal one of the most socially paralyzing structures humanity has ever endured. A number of years ago, the Central Bank of the United States, the Federal Reserve, produced a document entitled Modern Money Mechanics. This publication detailed the institutionalized practice of money creation as utilized by the Federal Reserve and the web of global commercial banks it supports. On the opening page, the document states its objective. The purpose of this booklet is to describe the basic process of money creation in a fractional reserve banking system. It then proceeds to describe this fractional reserve process through various banking terminology. A translation of which goes something like this. The United States government decides it needs some money, so it calls up the Federal Reserve and requests, say, $10 billion. The Fed replies, saying, sure, we'll buy $10 billion in government bonds from you. So the government takes some pieces of paper, paints some official looking designs on them, and calls them treasury bonds. Then it puts a value on these bonds to the sum of $10 billion and sends them over to the Fed. In turn, the people at the Fed draw up a bunch of impressive pieces of paper themselves, only this time calling them Federal Reserve Notes, also designating a value of $10 billion to the set. The Fed then takes these notes and trades them for the bonds. Once this exchange is complete, the government then takes the $10 billion in Federal Reserve Notes and deposits it into a bank account. And, upon this deposit, the paper notes officially become legal tender money, adding $10 billion to the U.S. money supply. And there it is. $10 billion in new money has been created. Of course, this example is a generalization, for, in reality, this transaction would occur electronically, with no paper used at all. In fact, only 3% of the U.S. money supply exists in physical currency. The other 97% essentially exists in computers alone. Now, government bonds are, by design, instruments of debt. And when the Fed purchases these bonds, with money it essentially created out of thin air, the government is actually promising to pay back that money to the Fed. In other words, the money was created out of debt. This mind-numbing paradox of how money or value can be created out of debt or a liability will become more clear as we further this exercise. So, the exchange has been made and now $10 billion sits in a commercial bank account. Here is where it gets really interesting. For as based on the fractional reserve practice, that $10 billion deposit instantly becomes part of the bank's reserves, just as all deposits do. And, regarding reserve requirements, as stated in Modern Money Mechanics, a bank must maintain legally required reserves equal to a prescribed percentage of its deposits. It then quantifies this by stating, under current regulations, the reserve requirement against most transaction accounts is 10%. This means that with a $10 billion deposit, 10% or $1 billion is held as the required reserve while the other nine billion is considered an excessive reserve and can be used as the basis for new loans. Now, it is logical to assume that this nine billion is literally coming out of the existing ten billion dollar deposit. 
however, this is actually not the case. What really happens is that the nine billion is simply created out of thin air on top of the existing ten billion dollar deposit. This is how the money supply is expanded. As stated in modern money mechanics, of course they, the banks, do not really pay out loans from the money they receive as deposits. If they did this, no additional money would be created. What they do when they make loans is to accept promissory notes, loan contracts, in exchange for credits, money, to the borrower's transaction accounts. In other words, the nine billion can be created out of nothing simply because there is a demand for such a loan and that there is a ten billion dollar deposit to satisfy the reserve requirements. Now, let's assume that somebody walks into this bank and borrows the newly available nine billion dollars. They will then most likely take that money and deposit it into their own bank account. The process then repeats, for that deposit becomes part of the bank's reserves. 10% is isolated and in turn 90% of the 9 billion or 8.1 billion is now available as newly created money for more loans. And of course that 8.1 can be loaned out and redeposited creating an additional 7.2 billion to 6.5 billion to 5.9 billion etc. This deposit money creation loan cycle can technically go on to infinity. The average mathematical result is that about 90 billion dollars can be created on top of the original 10 billion. In other words, for every deposit that ever occurs in the banking system, about nine times that amount can be created out of thin air. Money jitters, ask the obliging Bank of America for a jar of soothing instant money, M-O-N-E-Y, in the form of a convenient personal loan. So, now that we understand how money is created by this fractional reserve banking system, a logical yet elusive question might come to mind. What is actually giving this newly created money value? The answer? The money that already exists. The new money essentially steals value from the existing money supply. For the total pool of money is being increased irrespective to demand for goods and services. And as supply and demand finds equilibrium, prices rise, diminishing the purchasing power of each individual dollar. This is generally referred to as inflation, and inflation is essentially a hidden tax on the public. What is the advice that you generally get, and that is inflate the currency? They don't say debase the currency, they don't say devalue the currency, they don't say cheat the people who are saved, they say lower the interest rates. The real deception is when we distort the value of money. When we create money out of thin air, we have no savings, and yet there's so-called capital. So my question boils down to this. How in the world can we expect to solve the problems of inflation, that is, the increase in the supply of money, with more inflation? Of course, it can't. The fractional reserve system of monetary expansion is inherently inflationary. For the act of expanding the money supply without there being a proportional expansion of goods and services in the economy will always de scenes of an old building being purposely dynamited and blown up. Anybody who's ever watched a building being demolished on purpose knows that if you're going to do this, you have to get at the under infrastructure of a building and bring it down. The way the structure is collapsing, this was the result of something that was planned. It's not accidental that the first tower just happened to collapse and then the second tower just happened to collapse in exactly the same way. How they accomplished this, we don't know. The building collapsed to dust. You don't find a desk, you don't find a chair, you don't find a telephone, a computer, 
the biggest piece of a telephone I found was half of the keypad, and it was about this big. What happened to the concrete? The concrete was pulverized from river to river. There was dust powder, two, three inches thick. The concrete was just uh, pulverized. When we listen to those pictures, we've all seen too much on television before when a building was deliberately destroyed by world-placed dynamite to knock it down. I heard a second explosion. There was a uh, heavy-duty explosion. Then there was a second explosion, and then the subsequent collapse. The explosion blew, and it knocked everybody over. To me, it sounded like an explosion. It sounded like gunfire. Bang, 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 bang. And then all of a sudden, three big explosions. And we heard a big explosion coming down. And then the entire top of the building just blew up. We saw some kind of explosion. By the force of the explosion. Big explosion. Blew it back into the eighth floor. Then we get to the lobby. This is a big explosion. The lobby looked as though a bomb had exploded there. A huge explosion now raining debris. It's been a huge explosion. Huge explosion that we all heard and felt. We just witnessed some kind of follow-up explosion. We heard a very loud blast explosion. That is another bomb going off. He thinks that there were actually devices that were planted in the building. Planted in the building. I don't think anybody could have predicted that they would try to use an airplane as a missile, a hijacked airplane as a missile. Nobody in our government, at least, and I don't think the prior government that could envision flying airplanes in the buildings. No specific threat involving uh, really a domestic operation or involving uh, what happened, obviously, you know, the city's uh, airliner and so forth. There uh, were uh, no warning signs that I'm aware of. USA Today reports that in the two years before the attacks on September the 11th, NORAD conducted exercises using hijacked airliners as weapons. And one target was the World Trade Center. In confidential documents from the Philippines obtained by CNN, the plan was clear. He will board any American commercial aircraft, control its cockpit, and dive it at the CIA headquarters. Other buildings targeted the Pentagon and the World Trade Center. Security and counterterrorism was blinking red, in the words of George Tennant, that the warnings of an imminent attack were so severe that something dramatic should have been done. It was unparalleled. Uh, instead, our president went on a month-long vacation. The head of Pakistani intelligence at the ISI, Mahmoud Ahmed, requested Omar Sheikh to wire $100,000 to Mohammed Atta, who was the lead hijacker. Did hijacker Mohammed Atta received wire transfers via Pakistan. The man sending the money to Atta is believed to be Ahmed Umar Saeed Sheikh. Omar Sheikh admitted he was supported by the Pakistan government's intelligence service, the ISI. Although we are told that four or five of the alleged hijackers were on each of the flights, if so, their names should have been on the flight manifest. But the flight manifests that have been released contain neither the names of the alleged hijackers nor any Arab names whatsoever. We know that the men who were supposedly the hijackers had their houses, cars, credit cards paid for by the U.S. government. They were, in truth, agents. Evidence was also apparently planted. The passport of one of the hijackers on Flight 11 was allegedly found in the rubble. Goes through the fireball, through the side of the plane, and comes down the ground unscathed. But something happened. 
For six months, they reported they had this passport. Boy, we've got it. We've got the proof. And then the guy stood up and was alive. Several of these 19 men are still alive. We're after Saddam Hussein. I mean, uh, Bin Laden. He's, he's, he's. January 2001, the Bush administration orders the FBI and intelligence agencies to back off investigations involving the Bin Laden family, including two of Osama Bin Laden's relatives, who were living, guess where, in Falls Church, Virginia, right next to CIA headquarters. When he was already America's most wanted criminal, he reportedly spent two weeks in the American hospital in Dubai, was treated by an American doctor, and visited by the local CIA agent. We have not seen one piece of evidence that links Osama bin Laden directly to the planning stages of September 11th. This failure to provide proof was later said to be unnecessary because bin Laden, in a video allegedly found in Afghanistan, admitted responsibility for the attacks. This confession is now widely cited as proof. But the man in this video has darker skin, fuller cheeks, and a broader nose than the Osama bin Laden of all other videos, who again seem to have planted evidence. In 1976, Osama's older brother Salim bin Laden hired a man in Texas by the name of Jim Bath to handle all the investments in the United States for the bin Laden family. Jim Bath also happens to be a personal, almost lifelong friend and former Air National Guard pilot with George W. Bush. The connections between the Bushes and the Bin Ladens become much more clear when George Herbert Walker Bush made trips to Saudi Arabia in 1998 and 2000 to meet with the Bin Laden family on behalf of a company called the Carlyle Group. How could anyone fly a 60-ton, 125-foot-wide, 44-foot-tall plane through this obstacle course? The aircraft, before striking the Pentagon, reportedly executed a 270-degree downward spiral. And yet Hani Han Ewer was known as a terrible pilot who could not safely fly even a small plane. No seats, no luggage, no bodies. Nothing but bricks and limestone. The official explanation is that the intense heat from the jet fuel vaporized the entire plane. Flight 77 had two Rolls-Royce engines made of steel and titanium alloy and weigh six tons each. It is scientifically impossible that 12 tons of steel and titanium was vaporized by jet fuel. We're also told that the bodies were able to be identified either by their fingerprints or by the DNA. So what kind of fire can vaporize aluminum and tempered steel and yet leave, leave human bodies intact? From my close-up inspection, uh, there's no evidence of a plane having crashed anywhere near the Pentagon. And as I said, the only pieces left uh, that you can see are, are small enough that you could pick up in your hand. Shortly after the strike, government agents picked up debris and carried it off. The entire lawn was covered with dirt and gravel so that any remaining forensic evidence was literally covered up. Well, the videos from security cameras, which would show what really hit the Pentagon, were immediately confiscated by agents of the FBI. And the Department of Justice has to this day refused to release them. If these videos would prove that the Pentagon was really hit by a 757, most of us would assume the government would release them.
it looks like there's nothing there except for a hole in the ground. Uh, basically, that's right. The only thing you could see from where we were uh, was a big gouge in the earth and some broken trees. We could see some people working, walking around in the area, but from where we could see, there wasn't much left. Any large pieces of debris at all? No, there was nothing, nothing that you could distinguish that a plane had crashed there. Pancake theory, according to which the fires, while not melting the steel, heated it up sufficiently to cause the floors weakened by the airplane strikes to break loose from the steel columns, and this started a chain reaction. So you would expect then from that theory, which is the official theory, to see a whole stack of floors piled up on top of each other and then a spindle of core columns standing too. The core of each of the twin towers consisted of 47 massive steel columns. If the floors had broken loose from them, these columns would have still been sticking up into the air a thousand feet. The plane did not cut all those core columns. We designed the buildings to take the impact of the Boeing 707 uh, hitting the building at any location. The building probably could sustain multiple impacts of jetliners. That the plane flew straight into the building. Straight through, through him, right. Yeah. So you're saying that the building was actually designed to cope with a hole like that and right. then still yeah. survive? Yeah, it was, it was. If you had dropped, say, a billiard ball from the top of the World Trade Center, 110 floors up there, it would have taken 8 to 10 seconds to hit the ground, encountering no resistance whatsoever. The Twin Towers came down in nearly free fall speed. 200,000 tons of steel shatters and explodes outwards over 500 feet. This means that floors shattered at an average rate of about 10 floors per second. There is no scenario for a pancake effect of buildings falling that allows them to fall at the rate of free fall. Now what can do that? What, what can move mass out of the way? Explosives. Forty-seven huge steel columns going up the core. And they're interconnected. How do you get uh, them to fail simultaneously so the core disappears? It looks like those core columns were cut. The way we do this is by cutting the beam at an angle. I started looking at the molten metal. All three buildings, both towers in the rubble, in the basement areas, and building seven, there's these pools of molten metal. You'd get down below and you'd see molten steel, molten steel running down the channel rails, like you're in a foundry. Mm -hmm. The molten steel was found three, four, and five weeks later when the rubble was being removed. He said that molten steel was also found underneath World Trade Center 7. So I'm looking through the official reports. What do they say about the molten metal? They say nothing. But wait a minute. This is important evidence. So where did that come from? Thermite is so hot that it'll just cut through steel, through structural steel, for example, like a knife through butter. The products are molten iron and aluminum oxide, which goes off primarily as a dust. You know those enormous dust clouds? You can imagine when you assemble these chemicals on a large scale. Molten metal pools under both towers after they collapsed and Building 7. Now, Building 7 wasn't even hit by a, a jet. Part of the problem is that most people simply don't know much about Building 7 due to the extraordinary secrecy surrounding this collapse. And this was a 47-story skyscraper. This building fell at 525 
It was not hit by a plane. This building had fires on only two or three floors. And it was brought down by what we know was a controlled demolition. Demolitions, they look just like that. You know, a kink in the middle, and then that building just comes straight down almost at free fall speed. They first blow one of the central columns so the building falls in on itself. Building 7 had a classic crimp, or wedge. Its central column was blown out first, so it didn't structurally damage buildings just a few feet away from it. Our office was on the B-1 level. As I was talking to a supervisor at A-46, and all of a sudden we hear, BOOM! An explosion so hard that pushed us upwards. And it came from the basement between the B-2 level and the B-3 level. And when I went to verbalize, we hear, BOOM! The impact of the plane on the top. As I'm walking by the main freight car of the building in the corridor, that's, that's when I got blown. I mean, the impact of the explosion threw me to the floor, and that's when everything started happening. All of a sudden, a big impact happened again, and all the ceiling tile was falling down, the light fixtures were falling. You know, you got to go clear across the hole from one to, one to two World Trade Center, and then all of a sudden, it happened all over again. Well, something else hit us to the floor. Right in the basement, you felt it. Walls were caving in, everything that was going on. I mean, I know people that got killed in the basement. I know people that got broken legs in, their, in the basement. People that got reconstructive surgery because the walls hit them in the face. According to standard operating procedure, if an FAA flight controller notices anything that suggests a possible hijacking, the controller is to contact a superior. If the problem cannot be fixed within about a minute, the superior is to ask NORAD, the North American Aerospace Command, to send up or scramble jet fighters to find out what is going on. NORAD then issues the scramble order to the nearest Air Force base with fighters on alert. But although interceptions usually occur within 10 or so minutes, in this case, 80 or so minutes, had elapsed before fighters were even airborne. It's a mind-bending anomaly. Not a single U.S. Air Force interceptor turns a wheel until it's too late. There are no jets at all. What if they were so confused and had been so deliberately confused that they couldn't respond? The reason that they didn't know where to go was because a number of conflicting and overlapping uh, war game exercises were taking place. It involved the insertion of false radar blips onto radar screens in the Northeast Air Defense Sector. Lieutenant Team U, we have a, a problem here. We have a hijacked aircraft headed towards New York. We need someone to scramble some S-16s or something up there to help us out. Is this, is this real world or exercise? Is this, is this real world or exercise? There was another exercise, Vigilant Warrior, which was in fact, according to a NORAD source, a live fly hijack drill being conducted at the same time. With only eight available fighter aircraft, and they have to be dispatched in pairs, they were dealing with as many as 22 possible hijacks on the day of 9-11, and they couldn't separate the war game exercises from the actual hijacks. Page 172. The U.S. government has not been able to determine the origin of the money used for the 9-11 attacks. Ultimately, the question is of little practical significance. The American authorities have not managed to trace the source of the funding. And then the most amazingly disingenuous statement ultimately is it of little consequence. It is a massive consequence. Doesn't it matter who paid for 9-11? The collapse of Building 7 has been recognized as especially difficult to explain. The 9-11 Commission report implicitly admitted that it could not explain the collapse of this building. 
by not even mentioning it. Mr. President, why are you and the Vice President insisting on appearing together before the 9-11 Commission? Because the 9-11 Commission, Commission wants to ask us questions. That's why we're meeting, and I look forward to meeting with them and answering their questions. Uh, Sir, uh, why you're appearing together rather than separately, which was their request? Because it's a good chance for both of us to answer questions that the 9-11 Commission is uh, looking forward to asking us, and I'm looking forward to answering them. Let's see. Do you think they should be able to stand up and, and, and speak their own words? They should go under oath. They should be, yeah, in public. Don't you think that the families deserve to have a transcript or to be able to see what you Adam, said? Adam, you asked me that question yesterday. I got the today. same answer, yeah. The final report was a unanimous report. That means that if there was a single commissioner who had any objection about anything, that fact would be dropped from the report. We have found out that he not only served on the transition team of the Bush administration, that he was a person who wrote a draft memo for the setup of the Bush administration's National Security Council, that he was an individual who wrote the preemptive war strategy that was eventually used for the war in Iraq, that he is a close friend of Condoleezza Rice's. We want him to resign. There is literally nothing in the 9-11 report that the Bush administration did not approve of. We can understand, therefore, why the commission, under Zelikow's leadership, would have ignored all the evidence that would point to the truth, that 9-11 was a false flag operation intended to authorize the doctrines and funds needed for a new level of imperial mobilization. Armed with knives, armed with chemical, biological, nuclear weapons. Fanatics, terrorists, September 11th. September 11th, killers, September 11th, terrorists. Terrorists of Al-Qaeda, terrorists, nuclear weapons, terrorists. 9-11, terror, terror, terrorists, evil. September 11th, September 11th. The terrorists, war and danger. September 11th, terrorism, global terrorism, terrorism, terrorists. Terrorists, 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 the terror. Terrorists, terrorists, terrorism. September 11th, global terrorism, terrorists, terror, terrorism. September 11th, world terror. Terrorism, 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 September 11, global terrorism. September the 11th, terror, 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 weapons of mass destruction. September the 11th, September the 11th, terrorists, the evil terrorists, 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 no. Terrorism. The words are hypnotically repeated. Terrorism, terrorist, terrorist threat, and of course, believed to be linked to Al-Qaeda. But it's the so-called war on terrorism that's in our faces practically 24-7 as the inescapable focus of our existence. One day, our grandchildren will look back on this time and ask, how was the war on terror won? The entire U.S. ruling class, ruling elite, comes to see terrorism as the preferred means, indeed the only means, to provide social cohesion, to provide an enemy image for the society to keep it together. According to neocon theory from Carl Schmitt, you have to have an enemy image in order to have a society. It's a very dangerous thing because now it means that the entire social order, the political parties, intellectual life, politics in general, all based on a monstrous myth, monstrous myth. Look, the CIA has done in this country, what they've done to us is unbelievable. Look at the terrorist acts that have occurred. The CIA behind most, if not all of them. We had the Marine Barracks, we had our embassy in Kenya. We had Pan Am, 103. We had the USS Cole. Uh, we had Oklahoma City. We had the World Trade Center in 1993. That helped the terrorists blow up the World Trade Center the first time. They built the bomb. They, they got the driver's license. 
the informant, the FBI informant, fellow named Salam, a 43-year-old former Egyptian uh, army officer, he was given the assignment to put the bomb together. And he went to his supervisor, his FBI supervisor, and said, we're going to put a dummy bomb in here, right? He, and the FBI supervisor said, no, we're going to put a real bomb. The FBI actually carried out the attack on the World Trade Center in 1993. They actually hired Ahmad Salam and paid him $1 million and gave him real explosives, a detonator, and told him to build a bomb and to give it to the foolish people that he was controlling to allow them to attack the World Trade Center complex. Unfortunately for them, there were only six people killed, not enough to pass the legislation. So what happened is two years later, April 19, 1995, down comes Oklahoma City, uh, Murrah building, 168 people killed. One year later, the anti-terrorism legislation that takes away any of our constitutional rights and civil liberties is passed. Because at half past nine this morning, we were actually running an exercise for over a company of a thousand people in London based on simultaneous bombs going off precisely at the railway stations that happened this morning. So I still have the hairs on the back of my neck standing upright. To get this quite straight, you were running uh, an exercise to see where, how you would cope with this and it happened while you were running the exercise. Precisely. supposed to believe is some kind of coincidence, there was also an anti-terrorist drill going on on 7-7. And again, just like 9-11, they were talking about attacks on the same targets, the same kind of tube stations, and exactly the same time as the actual attack happened, providing some kind of cover for what must be operations orchestrated in some way by the state. absolutely appalled at how much people in this country do not think we are given to understand that, a, uh, that an Arabic guy out there in, up in the mountains financed the most elaborate attack on this country. Do you think some people in a cave, do you think some people in a cave were able to have NORAD stand down? Do you think that people in a cave were able to have all of this happen? And when I think about how many Americans were killed in New York City and believing as I do that this thing was a setup job, this is a textbook operation that Nazis used and they've used it over and over again. America has been suckered in one more time. I don't have to tell you things are bad. Everybody knows things are bad. The dollar buys a nickel's worth. Banks are going bust. Shopkeepers keep a gun under the counter. Punks are running wild in the street. There's nobody anywhere who seems to know what to do, and there's no end to it. We know the air is unfit to breathe, and our food is unfit to eat. We sit watching our TVs while some local newscaster tells us that today we had 15 homicides and 63 violent crimes, as if that's the way it's supposed to be. We know things are bad, worse than bad. They're crazy. It's like everything everywhere is going crazy, so we don't go out anymore. We sit in the house, and slowly the world we're living in is getting smaller, and all we say is, please, at least leave us alone in our living rooms. Let me have my toaster and my TV and my steel-belted radios, and I won't say anything. Just leave us alone. Well, I'm not going to leave you alone. I want you to get mad. I don't want you to protest. I don't want you to write. I don't want you to write to your congressman because I wouldn't know what to tell you to write. I don't know what to do about the depression and the inflation and the Russians and the crime in the street. All I know is that first, you've got to get mad. You've got to say, I'm a human being. God damn it. My life has value.
It's really bad. It's black. It's arid. My wife thinks I'm all right. I called her and said I was leaving the building. I was fine. I am bang. Two three of us. Two broken windows. When hostilities commenced in Europe in 1939, it was realized that the American people had no intention of entering the war. But they believed that this country could be enticed into the war in very much the same way that it was enticed into the last one. They planned first to prepare the United States for foreign war under the guise of American defense. Second, to involve us in the war step by step without our realization. Third, to create a series of incidents which would force us into the actual conflict. These plans were, of course, to be covered and assisted by the full power of their propaganda. Our theaters soon became filled with plays portraying the glory of war. Newsreels lost all semblance of objectivity. And they have used the war to justify the restriction of congressional power and the assumption of dictatorial procedures on the part of the president and his appointees. A fear campaign was inaugurated. We cannot allow the natural passions and prejudices of other peoples to lead our country to destruction. chauvinism to rabid nationalist fervor are beginning not to work. This is who I am and whether I'm good or bad or achieving or not, all that's learned along the way. Because it's just a ride and we can it's change it anytime we want. It's only a choice. No effort, no work, no job, no savings of money. I realized that I had the game wrong. That the game was to find out what I already was. Find out what I already was. You know, evolution did not end with us growing thumbs. And the reason our institutions, our traditional religions are all crumbling is because they're no longer relevant. Kids will ask their parents, Dad, couldn't you see that war was inevitable when you produce scarcity? Power does what it wants. Power does what it wants. And now they're just more naked about it. Now they just put it right out front and say, this is what we're doing to you folks. And everybody's got a cell phone that makes pancakes so they don't want to rock the boat. The entire money structured and materialistic oriented society is a false society. There is no human nature. There's human behavior. And that's always been changed throughout history. What we need is a true change of consciousness where we understand the interrelationship between all of us. There are no Negro problems, or Polish problems, or Jewish problems, or Greek problems, or women's problems. They're human problems. The society that we're about to talk about is a society that is free of all the old superstitions, incarceration, prisons, Police, bankers, advertising, gone forever because it's no longer relevant. <laughs>